And welcome to a quiet desert. Uh, as you can see, I'm in a hotel room uh, right now. I'm in Dubai from where I'm recording this video. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to record and upload any videos lately uh, because of work and uh, travel. At least I'm in a desert area. Uh, <laughs> um, however, uh, this video uh, is named uh, The Bride and I uh, find this topic about the Bride of Jesus so interesting and important that I just had to make, uh, make this video uh, even if I have uh, to use uh, my little blogger camera uh, and I don't have uh, the uh, normal equipment with uh, lighting and video editing and uh, etc. And there's also uh, some noise from the air condition. I don't want to uh, switch it off because it's uh, like 41 degrees outside. I don't want to fry doing this video, which is uh, quite uh, long. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, why is this uh, topic so important? Uh, the question is kind of stupid. Uh, think about it. Uh, if you are going to marry a king, uh, would you like to know all the details about the groom, the wedding, and the kingdom you are about to enter? Uh, now, the bride reveals the redemption work of Jesus Christ and how that affects our identity, role, and inheritance in the kingdom of God. I have sometimes uh, encountered opposition from uh, other Christians when I say that the heavenly Jerusalem the one written about in uh, detail in the book of Revelation is uh, the Bride of Jesus. That resistance can be attributed to two things. Uh, the first is the general opinion that the heavenly Jerusalem is a physical city built of gold and precious gemstones. And the second is uh, because I haven't set aside uh, time to explain the Bride's association with the heavenly Jerusalem in a clear and on ambiguous uh, manner. I'm sorry if I'm looking down like this, but uh, I have to follow some notes. Uh, I can't remember uh, ed uh, everything by heart. <clears throat> uh, however, uh, this unambiguous uh, uh, confusion um, I will remedy in this video. And by the end of the video, I'm also going to emphasize why uh, this knowledge is important and uh, what it means in regard to approaching uh, the end times. Virtually all Christians who have read their Bible, they understand that when Jesus comes back, that he will marry his bride, a bride who is uh, without a blemish, without spot and wrinkle. Although Jesus in the Gospels often referred to the bride uh, indirectly, he never spoke directly about the bride, but Paul and John did, and so did probably the rest of the apostles as well. I'm pretty sure that virtually every Jewish Christian uh, in the, at the time of Jesus, uh, that they were aware of the prophetic scriptures that tell of how God marries Israel. And they knew this because they had a much more in-depth uh, knowledge of the prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament than the ever uh, Christian has today. The Old Testament scriptures from Exodus to the prophets are full of allusions to Israel's marriage to God, Israel's uh, faithlessness in this marriage, and the promise of a new restorative marriage uh, with Israel and not least with Jerusalem. After all, the New Testament had not uh, yet been written, so all they had were the canonical uh, books of the Old Testament. I believe the concept of Israel as a bride was so inculcated in the consciousness of uh, the Christian Jews that there was uh, simply no need for any deeper explanation. Uh, here's an example of how uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, used the picture concept of God marrying his uh, perfect bride, the pure virgin. Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous, uh, jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
In the Law of Moses, we can read about how the high priest uh, was uh, only allowed to marry a chaste virgin. Uh, for example, he was not allowed to marry a former prostitute or a divorcee. Uh, when Paul said that he had betrothed the Corinthians to Christ, he simply meant that through his preaching of Jesus, they had come to faith and they had been saved. They had figuratively become betrothed to Christ. The Corinthians who were not brought up under the law of Moses, uh, like the Jews were. Uh, they were certainly not chaste virgins, but the true salvation and the purification of the word. They had not only been redeemed from their sins, but they had also been sanctified. They had been made saints. They had spiritually transformed into pure virgins without blemishes and wrinkles ready uh, to be united with Christ the day uh, he comes to retrieve his bride without blemish and wrinkle. In the epistle to the Ephesians we see another example of how Paul uses the picture of the bride and marriage. Paul's epistles to the Ephesians chapter 5 uh, verses 25 to 26. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, having, uh, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. As I said, uh, the high priest, uh, not only the high priest, but the priest of the Old Testament was only allowed to marry a chaste virgin. Uh, as was our high priest Jesus, uh, when he comes back to uh, pick up his bride, the church, the bride must be spotless, holy and unblemished. Now, let's uh, read what uh, is written in the Law of Moses about the anointed priest's uh, obligation to marry a clean bride. Leviticus chapter 21 verses 13 to 14 And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman, or a defiled woman, or a harlot. These he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of his own people as wife, a virgin of his own people. The anointed priest was not allowed to marry a stranger, no, uh, he had to marry someone uh, from one of the twelve tribes of Israel. The priest could only marry one of his own people, uh, and have this in mind, because I'll come back to that. Every Jew knew that God spiritually had entered into a marriage uh, with Israel, uh, which happened when God through Moses made a covenant written on stone tables uh, with Israel. Uh, I'm referring to the Old Covenant. However, over time many marital problems arose, uh, especially when uh, after the death of King Solomon, Israel was split into two kingdoms, namely the Kingdom of Israel, with its uh, capital city uh, Tirza and later Samaria, and uh, then the kingdom uh, of Judah with its capital city, Jerusalem. Uh, the kingdom of Israel, also called the house of Israel, uh, committed marital adultery from the uh, start by turning to other gods. And although God repeatedly sent his prophets to the house of Israel, urging her to repent of her adultery, uh, uh, her adultery she wouldn't. Uh, eventually God became so angry with the house of Israel that he gave her a letter of divorce and allowed her to be exiled by the Assyrians, uh, where she had plenty of time to think about her sins. Quite a few years later, Judah's house followed. Uh, the last righteous king was uh, Josiah, which you can learn more about if you watch my video, The Last Kings of Judah. I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, but after the death of Josiah, Judah's house also committed adultery, and although God sent the prophet Jeremiah with a call for repentance, she refused to repent of her infidelity. God therefore also gave the house of Judah a letter of divorce and the house of Judah was attacked by the Babylonians and was taken into exile to uh, Babylon where she had plenty of time to think about her sins. 
This marriage with various marital problems, uh, which eventually ended in divorce, is mentioned uh, many places in the Bible, especially in the book, uh, the books of Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, and uh, Ezekiel. Let me give you an example. Uh, Jeremiah chapter three, verse six and verse eight. The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king. Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? Uh, she has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. The house of Israel, the unfaithful woman, placed uh, idols on the hills and under the green uh, trees. Uh, she committed spiritual adultery, and so did the house of Judah. Uh, then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah uh, did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. Uh, as a cautionary example, the house of Israel uh, was overpowered and exiled by the Assyrians because of their idolatry. Uh, although the house of Judah saw uh, that fate of the house of Israel, uh, she also went and worshipped the idols. In the book of Ezekiel, you can read about how God married Israel and how uh, the two sisters, uh, Ohola and Oholiba, uh, symbolizing the house of Israel and the house of Judah, uh, respectively, they turned away from God and began to worship the idols of the uh, surrounding countries. Ezekiel chapter 23, verses 1 to 5. The word of the Lord uh, came again to me, saying, Son of man, uh, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. They committed harlotry in Egypt. They committed harlotry in their youth. Uh, their breasts were embraced. They are virgin bosom. bosom. Uh, I don't know the uh, pronunciation. But their virgin bosom was breast. Their names, Ohola and the elder Oholiba, uh, her sister, they were mine. And they bore sons and daughters. As uh, for their names, Samaria is Ohola and Jerusalem is Oholiba. Uh, the older sister, Samaria, Ohola played the harlot even uh, though she was mine. As mentioned, uh, Tirza and later Samaria was the capital of Israel, while uh, Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. Ezekiel's book, chapter 23, is about these two women's marriage to God and their marital infidelity with Egypt, Assyria and Babylonia, nations which God had forbidden them to seek um, alliance. You can read uh, Ezekiel chapter 23 uh, yourself if you want to know the exact details of Israel's infidelity. The essence of this message is that the ancient Israel, which was later divided into the house of Israel and the house of Judah, was separated from God because of marital adultery. After the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians around 587 BC, uh, the divorce was a reality and God uh, was figuratively a divorced man. But even though Israel had been unfaithful, God had not forgotten Israel and through his son Jesus Christ, God now offered a new restorative marriage covenant with Israel. However, this marriage was a different marriage. The old marriage that disintegrated had been a marriage of convenience based on the law written on stone tablets. But the new marriage was to be a love relationship based on the spirit of love, the spirit of God poured out uh, in the hearts um, uh, to the Holy Spirit. And Jeremiah, he prophesied about this new and different marriage. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 33. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by uh, the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it uh, on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will be their God, and they shall be 
my people, my covenant which they broke law. I was a husband to them. Figuratively speaking, the Israelites broke the marriage with God. But Jeremiah prophesied that there would come days when God would institute a new marriage, a new covenant with the house of Israel, where the law on stone tablets was replaced by the law of God written in the heart. The love of God poured into the heart through the Holy Spirit, as uh, Paul expressed it in his letter uh, to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 5. When an Israelite entered into a marriage covenant at the time, uh, there was usually a period of betrothal. Betrothal? I don't know if I can pronounce this word. Never mind. Uh, and that was when the husband went away uh, to prepare himself uh, financially and uh, prepare uh, a residence uh, for uh, his bride before the wedding itself uh, or the wedding party uh, was to take place. The betrothal period was not like um, what we know as an engagement period where you still have the right to regret. No, the betrothal was binding. Uh, at the betrothal ceremony uh, a marriage contract was signed, uh, the so-called Kituba, which was signed by two witnesses. Uh, and then the marriage was uh, blessed with the blessing uh, of the wine. And in doing so, the bride and the groom uh, drank from the same glass of wine as a symbol of joy and blessing in the marriage. Uh, and there were also other traditions as well, but I mentioned uh, this uh, tradition with the wine because Jesus symbolically drank a glass of wine with his disciples uh, in the uh, upper uh, room uh, before his death, uh, which many Bible scholars consider as a new covenant betrothal uh, ceremony. Now, the only difference between a real marriage was that the marriage had not yet, yet been uh, uh, sexually consummated and that the husband went away to prepare himself financially and to prepare a home in which they could move in and live together. The wedding ceremony and associated wedding party uh, was not as it is in our tradition, no. Uh, the wedding party was something which came later, a party that was only held when the groom was completely ready to move into the prepared home with the bride. Now, when the husband had finished these uh, preparations, which often took several years, uh, he would come back unannounced uh, one day to pick up his bride. At the death, death of the cross, Jesus paid uh, for our sins and he instituted a new covenant with the Jews, uh, these Jews who came to believe in him, and uh, that covenant was made with Israel, uh, that is, with the Israelites who came to believe in him, um, and uh, then Jesus ascended into heaven, and uh, we who have come to faith in Jesus, uh, we are now waiting for him to come back uh, to gather us to him as a bride, waiting uh, for the bridegroom. Figuratively, we who believe in him and have received the Holy Spirit in our hearts, had made a binding betrothal covenant with Jesus. And Jesus has gone away to prepare an abode for us, and when he comes back to pick up his bride, the wedding will begin. When the Israelites were unfaithful and gone, divorced the Israelites, uh, the holy city of Jerusalem uh, was uh, destroyed by the Babylonians. However, just as the new covenant with Israel is a spiritual covenant uh, in our hearts, so is the restoration of Jerusalem. Instead of an earthly Jerusalem, we have entered into a spiritual Jerusalem, uh, a heavenly Jerusalem where we serve God in the spirit. And I'll come back to that. The spiritual realm can be quite difficult to comprehend because it describes something uh, we can't see. Uh, we can't see the new Jerusalem, which is the invisible kingdom of heaven uh, living uh, within us and in our midst. We actually constitute the new Jerusalem. In several places in the Bible we can read that God, he married to Jerusalem. And of course you can't marry a physical city, so obviously the Bible is not talking about the earthly Jerusalem in these passages. And, uh, definitely I'll come to this also. <laughs> Uh, let me quote a couple of verses that speaks about how God the Builder, he marries Jerusalem. 
In the book of Isaiah, chapter 62, uh, 62, the boundaries uh, blend when it comes to when the new restored Israel is spoken of and when the new restored Jerusalem is spoken of. But first, the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, which deals uh, with the new marriage contract uh, with Israel, um, and I'm talking about the restored Israel. Isaiah, chapter 54, verses 4 to 6. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, and neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth, and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, and he is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you. Like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife uh, when you were refused, says your God. The shame of Israel's youth is an allusion to the old covenant and the divorce from God uh, when God rejected his people because of adultery. But, but now we see how God once again uh, takes Israel as his wife. In verses 11 and 12 we see how Isaiah uh, uses a picture of a city in the sense that God is rebuilding Israel as a city made of precious stones. Isaiah chapter 54 verses 11 to 12 O oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems, and lay your foundations with sapphires, I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. This description of the bride as a city built of precious stones can be found de uh, described in detail in the book of Revelation, where the angel with the seventh trumpet says, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And uh, he takes John up uh, to Mount uh, Zion and then he shows him uh, the holy city descending down from God, and I'll come uh, back to that later. But first, let's take a closer look at uh, Isaiah uh, chapters uh, 6 to 62, uh, which talk about both the restored Israel and the restored Jerusalem. In these chapters, the borders between Israel and Jerusalem merge, uh, indicating, as in chapter 54, that Israel is a city in a spiritual sense, and not just a city, but a holy city the holy city of Jerusalem, and not the earthly Jerusalem, but the new restored Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 to 2 Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. At the Olivet Discourse, uh, Jesus said that there would be signs in the sun and the moon and that the powers of heaven would be shaken. And he said that when we see this happen, that we should lift our heads because our redemption draws near. Uh, a time will come when the glory of the Lord in a special way will shine upon his people. And that would be when the darkness covers the earth. Isaiah chapter 60 verses 3 to 5 The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your hearts uh, shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wells of the Gentiles shall come. To you, the wills of the Gentiles shall come to you. Uh, when the Israelites, they left uh, Egypt uh, under the old covenant, they, they went out with the riches of the Egyptians. Two mighty signs and plagues, the Egyptians had gained so much respect for the Israelites that they gave them their riches. Let me read from Exodus chapter 12, uh, verses uh, 35 to 36. Now, the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they have asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. Thus 
they plundered Egypt. Oh, thus they plundered the Egyptians. God has not changed. Uh, in the end times, uh, when darkness cover uh, the earth, God will once again lead his people out through my designs and wonders. Uh, at the time when uh, smoke and darkness cover the earth, God's people will shine again. And Isaiah prophesied that the nations will see the light and bring their riches to God's people. As I said, God has not changed. After describing the riches brought to God's people, Isaiah continues to describe the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 60 uh, verses uh, 10 to 11. The sons of foreigners shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I had mercy on you. Therefore your gates shall be open continually, they shall not be shut day or night, uh, that men may bring to you the wealth of the Gentiles and their kings uh, in procession, the wealth of the Gentiles. And then Isaiah goes on to describe God's restored people Israel and also the restored Jerusalem. Isaiah does not seem to distinguish between God's holy people and the city Jerusalem and that uh, for a good reason. Uh, God's holy people constitutes the new Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem is a bride. Uh, John understood Isaiah's picture with Israel as Jerusalem and uh, referenced from the book of Isaiah chapter 60 to describe the bride, the new Jerusalem. Let me give you an example. Revelation chapter 21 verses 24 to 25. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no light there. But uh, the book of Revelation refers not only to uh, Isaiah chapter 62, 62 as a city, but also directly to uh, the church of God. Uh, let me give you an example of this. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 14 Also the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bowing to you, and those who despised you shall fall prostrate at the soles of your feet, and they shall call you the city of the Lord, uh, Zion, the Holy One of Israel. So what should they call God's people? Yes, you are right, the city of the Lord, Jerusalem. Here Isaiah makes the promise that those who oppress God's people will one day come and cast themselves at the feet of God's people. Compare this to Jesus' promise in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3 verse 9 Indeed I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they, that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. The Philadelphia congregation experienced great oppression and persecution from uh, those Jews who did not believe in Jesus but still adhered to the Old Covenant, the Law of Moses. By referring to the book of Isaiah, Jesus promised that these oppressors would come and throw uh, themselves at their feet. But Jesus also made another promise to the Philadelphian church. Revelation chapter 3 verse 12 he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. Compare this to Isaiah chapter 60 verse 14. Also the sons of you who afflicted you shall come bowing to you, and all those who despised you shall fall prostrate at the soles of your feet, and they shall call you the city of the Lord, Zion, the Holy One of Israel. Consider that Jesus promised to give the righteous Philadelphians the name of the city of God, the New Jerusalem, which is a direct reference to the book of Isaiah. They shall call you the city of the Lord. God's people, the church, is the New Jerusalem. Let me repeat, God's people, the church, is the New Jerusalem. The book of Isaiah chapter 61 deals with the glorification and spiritual service of God's people and uh, places less emphasis on the design 
uh, of the restored Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 6, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Uh, they shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. In Exodus chapter 19 verse 6, God promised that Israel would be a royal priesthood. Uh, but that privilege was uh, lost when Israel uh, turns it, its back to uh, God and God divorced Israel. Uh, Exodus chapter 19 verse 6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. As I said, this privilege uh, was lost when the, the houses of Israel turned away from God and uh, worshipped the idols. But the restored Israel has regained this privilege. Uh, referring to Exodus chapter 19 verse 6, Peter he wrote in his letter that we who used to live in darkness have been called out of the darkness into the glorious light to be a royal priesthood. This new Israelite priesthood, which is different from the Levitical priesthood of the law of Moses, uh, is based on better promises. And Paul described this uh, spiritual priesthood in detail in uh, the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, if Paul he wrote the letter to the Hebrews, I'm not sure, but uh, it, it is written in the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, and I'll come to, uh, back to that later. Uh, but this royal priesthood is a bride, uh, what the book of Revelation calls the wife of the Lamb. The picture of God's people as a bride and Jesus as a bridegroom is derived from the prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament in the following verse. We see the redeemed bride rejoicing over uh, her bridegroom. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he had clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Compare this to Isaiah chapter 54, verses 4 to 6. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth, and you will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is uh, your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth, for the Lord has called you. Like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife, uh, when you were refused, says uh, your God. In verses 11 and 12 we see how uh, Isaiah used the building of a city as an analogy that God is rebuilding Israel the bride as a city made of precious stones. Isaiah chapter 54 uh, verses 11 to 12 Oh, you afflicted one tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems, and I will lay your foundations with sapphires, I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. The gemstones clear as crystal uh, illustrate the exalted, the precious, the worthy, the sacred. And the bride, she adorns herself with these precious uh, gemstones for her groom. She adorns herself with these characteristics for her groom. Hallelujah! In the book of Revelation, we can read about uh, how the bride, the holy Jerusalem, she looked like the brightest gemstones. Am I correct? And we can also uh, read uh, that she looked like Jasper. And why like Jasper? When John, he first saw Jesus sitting on the throne, the Son of Man on the throne, he explained that he looked like Jasper. So the bride resembles Jesus in dignity and holiness. In other words, we are called to live a life in dignity and holiness. From having been rejected and sent away with a letter of divorce, God has restored his people by a new covenant and has made us a royal priesthood. In Isaiah uh, chapter 62, the emphasis is again on the city of Jerusalem, and uh, it is uh, told how the master builder, God, he marries Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 5, As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Uh, 
some translation, uh, translations have so shall your sons marry you. However, the Hebrew word is Ben, uh, which means a son in singular, um, as a builder of a family name or figuratively as a builder of a nation. The bride is in New Jerusalem and God has not made a covenant with uh, a city of bricks and gemstones, uh, though he has made a covenant with his people. The New Restored Jerusalem is an analogy uh, designed to depict the restoration of Israel through the New Covenant, which we can read about uh, in Jeremiah chapters, um, chapter 31, verse 31 through 33. As we read the prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament, it becomes crystal clear that the restored Israel is equal to the restored Jerusalem, or the new Jerusalem, if you will, or the holy Jerusalem, and that the new, the holy Jerusalem is the bride, the bride of Jesus. Now we have come to a Bible message uh, which so many Christians uh, have never really understood, even though it's clearer than uh, many of the other messages of the Bible. Uh, so now listen carefully. Uh, the bride is Israel. In fact, all God's covenants and promises were uh, given to Israel. Uh, the old covenant written on stone tablets was made with Israel, but so was a new spiritual covenant written uh, in the hearts. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with whom? With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day uh, that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they, the Israelites, shall be my people. They shall be my people. The new covenant by the blood of Jesus applies to Israel, the house of Israel, and the house of Judah. So the covenants were between God and Israel. So how do you uh, and I, as a Gentile Christian, come into the picture? I mean, I am like uh, a quarter Swedish and uh, a little Danish, and, uh, and as far as I know, uh, there are no Jews in my family. Uh, I have no Israelite ancestors. Um, Jesus, who uh, was a Jew uh, from the tribe of Judah, uh, in the Revelation of John referred uh, to himself as the Lion of Judah. Jesus preached the gospel of the uh, kingdom of God to the Jews. All of Jesus' disciples, uh, they were Jews. The Bible was written by Jews. Uh, in fact, it took 10 years after Jesus' atonement on the cross before the Christian Jews realized that the Gentiles, the non-Israelites, uh, like myself and probably also most of you, they share in the salvation too. This idea that the Gentiles can share in the restoration too was so foreign to the early Christians that it actually took a divine revelation for them to comprehend it. Was that because Jesus' disciples were kind of ignorant? Uh, no, definitely not, but when you read the prophetic scriptures of the Bible, it is so crystal clear that uh, the salvation, the covenant and the restoration applies solely to Israel. How does God's covenant with Israel concern people from other nations than Israel? Jesus had chosen Peter, who was a Jew, to be the rock upon which he would build his church, am I correct? But even though the Old Testament prophetic scriptures mention the role of the Gentiles in regard to the New Covenant on several occasions, and even though Peter probably studied the Old Testament prophetic scriptures vigorously, it actually took a divine revelation for Peter to realize that people like uh, you and I, non-Israelites, had a chance to participate in the covenant between God and Israel. In Acts chapter 10, we can read uh, about how Peter was told three times to eat the unclean animals. 
Now, of course, Peter was not supposed to eat the roasted pork, but uh, the unclean animals uh, were a picture of the Gentiles, or they are a picture of the Gentiles, uh, the unclean people uh, from unclean nations who were not considered as God's uh, holy people, Israel. The first and the second time God gave Peter this vision, the rock uh, on which uh, he would build his church, uh, uh, Peter, he protested. I mean, uh, uh, he didn't understand what God was trying to tell him. But the third time, Peter realized that the Gentiles were also called to become part of the restored Israel. And Peter, obedient to this vision, he went down to Caesarea and preached the gospel to the uh, Gentile uh, house of Cornelius. Uh, in the beginning, Peter, he was a bit shaky, <laughs> a bit unsure uh, about the purpose of preaching the gospel to a Gentile. But when Cornelius and everyone in Cornelius' house received the Holy Spirit, Peter, he knew that salvation also was granted to the Gentiles. Hallelujah! Uh, the salvation of unclean animals had already been prophetically proclaimed when Noah was told to uh, take the unclean animals into the ark along with the clean animals but Peter and the other disciples they have never understood uh, that Peter. Today it's just the opposite. The Gentiles have become so accustomed uh, to salvation that they don't really know where to place Israel. Uh, and this probably also requires three divine revelations. Uh, consequently I don't expect everyone to understand this video. Uh, so maybe you should watch it three times, just a suggestion. Uh, we must have respect for Israel. Our annexation to Israel is not based on automaticity, but on a dispensation, a grace waiver, which I'll discuss later. The new covenant was made with Israel, and in the beginning the gospel was preached solely to the Jews. The fact is that Jesus is the bridegroom. He is the shepherd of Israel. He is not the shepherd of America, Albania or Denmark. No, uh, Jesus is the shepherd of Israel. John chapter 10 verses 14 to 16. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. By my own. As uh, the Old Testament said that he should, uh, uh, that the high priest should marry um, um, a virgin uh, from uh, his uh, family. Uh, I don't know the exact word, but he should marry uh, one of his own. Uh, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The other sheep, which are not of this fold. Hmm. The other sheep that Jesus spoke of, uh, yeah, they were the Gentiles. Uh, notice the words which are not of this fold, in other words, which do not belong to Israel. Although Jesus told his disciples that he had other sheep uh, which did not belong to Israel, it would take 10 years before they understood this. There will be one flock, one shepherd. Let me repeat, there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is important to grasp. Jesus used the analogy of the restored Israel as a flock of sheep who followed Jesus. Sheep who were known by the husband, uh, by the shepherd. Sheep who knew the shepherd. To join the flock, you must know Jesus. Paul here applied another analogy to the restored Israel, uh, namely the noble olive tree. Uh, branches had been chopped off due to disobedience. Uh, Israel was rejected because it broke the old covenant. Uh, uh, but the tree had begun to go again when the new covenant was introduced. Hallelujah! And the pagans, the branches of the wild olive tree who accepted the gospel, they had been grafted into the noble olive tree. Let me repeat, they had been grafted into the noble olive tree. Paul's letter to the Romans Chapter 11, verses 17 to 18. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against uh, the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. 
Here Paul points out to the Romans that they have been grafted into the noble olive tree, Israel, and not the other way around. Paul, he had to speak to the Romans in this way because many of the Gentiles had distanced themselves from Israel. We need to understand that we have been grafted into the restored Israel and not the other way around. Uh, there are not two olive trees, uh, one called the Jews and another called Israel. No, there is only one olive tree, which is God's people, Israel. And by a dispensation of grace, the Gentiles has been allowed to join Israel. There is only one flock, which is Israel, the bride. And there is only one shepherd, which of course is Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. The bride is Israel. There is not another bride who is called the church. Uh, God's church and the restored Israel are the one and same entity. The new covenant was not given to all nations, to everyone. No. Uh, the old covenant as well as the new covenant was given to Israel exclusively. Do you understand? The Gentiles has by dispensation been granted uh, the privilege to follow Israel and not the other way around. Many of the uh, prophets of the Old Testament prophesied that the Gentiles one day uh, would join Israel's salvation. I have written some examples of this on the board uh, that you can check for yourself in the Bible. I will leave these scriptures for a moment so you can uh, take a screenshot. All who had thoroughly studied the Old Testament prophetic scriptures referred to these uh, scriptures to explain the salvation of the Gentiles. Uh, Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 15 verses 9 to 12. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people with his people, the Israelites. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, allow him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he, who shall, uh, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him, the Gentiles shall hope. Under the old covenant, Gentiles could become a part of Israel if they met the following conditions. Uh, they had to be circumcised which is a picture of repentance under the uh, New Covenant. And uh, then they had to eat uh, the Passover lamb, which is a picture of uh, the partaking of Jesus' atonement on the cross, Jesus as the sacrificial lamb. The Passover feast was mandatory for the Israelites. For the Israelites. In fact, there was a death penalty for not participating in the Passover feast. The entire congregation of Israel, without exception uh, was to attend. But what about the Gentiles? Exodus chapter 12 verses 47 to 49. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his maids be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land. And he shall be as a native of the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. So there was no difference to be made between the country's own and the foreigners who were circumcised and observed the Passover feast. In the same way uh, it is under the new covenant. Uh, if a Gentile repents and believes in Jesus' uh, atonement work on the cross, then he must be considered like one of the country's own. Uh, he or she will be allowed to join Israel. And the rules and the laws that apply to Israel, yes, these laws apply to the strangers too. Israel is the bride. And the Gentile uh, who join Israel is by dispensation allowed to be a part of the bride. If a family adopts a new family member, then that family member does not automatically have the right of inheritance, am I correct? <clears throat> the same applies to a stranger uh, who, for example, travels to Denmark. Uh, being in Denmark on a visa does not include the same rights and privileges as those uh, who have citizenship uh, 
if a foreign national is to be granted Danish citizenship upon entry into Denmark, a special dispensation must be issued, uh, such as the one uh, which was granted when Crown Pr Prince uh, Frederick uh, he married uh, Crown Princess uh, Mary from uh, Australia. <coughs> the same applies to the Gentiles who, through faith in Jesus, have joined Israel. Since they do not belong to any of the twelve tribes of Israel, they do not automatically have the right of citizenship or inheritance. Uh, in order to obtain citizenship and inheritance rights, a special dispensation must be issued, uh, issued uh, a grace waiver. The Gentiles are not there on uh, tolerated residence, uh, but God has granted a dispensation of grace, which makes it possible to be accepted as one of the country's own. In the Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 1, Paul reveals the secret of the Gentiles' uh, dispensation of grace, which includes the right of inheritance. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Therefore I bent my knees, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. As uh, truly as you have heard of the commission uh, that God, by his grace, um, in Greek, or economia kais, uh, dispensation of grace, has given to you. By revelation, the secret is made known to me, as I briefly wrote about it before. As you read it, you can see that I have shared in uh, the Christ secret. Uh, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, uh, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of grace, or economia kais, uh, of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which uh, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What is that mystery? Uh, Paul elaborates on this mystery. The mystery is the dispensation of grace, and he elaborates on this mystery in the following verses. Uh, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And what is this mysterious dispensation? Now, listen carefully that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ to the gospel. Notice that the body is in singular. Uh, no distinction is being made between the Gentile church and the restored Israel. No distinction is being made between the Gentile church and the restored Israel. The body of Christ, the bride, is Israel. Uh, who uh, received the new covenant, the promise uh, which is based on better promises, and by a dispensation of grace, the uh, Gentiles have become fellow heirs of the same body. And the body is Israel, and partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 2, uh, verses 11 to 13. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, uh, Paul refers to the fact that the circumcision under the new covenant uh, is not done with hands as it was under the old covenant, but uh, by the circumcision of the heart, uh, by the Holy Spirit. That is uh, a spiritual circumcision that involves restoration and repentance. Uh, who are called uncircumcision by what? is called the circumcision made in flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Uh, notice that the covenants of promise are in plural, and uh, this is because all the covenants of promise, including the old and the new covenants, yeah, they were given to Israel having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let me tell you the truth. Uh, the way into 
God's kingdom is through Israel. That's why Jesus said that salvation proceeds uh, from the Jews. And that uh, was why John wrote uh, in the book of Revelation that the entrance doors to the holy Jerusalem had the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Do you understand? Uh, the church is not a separate entity which is different from Israel. The entrance doors into the kingdom of God, they bear the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. And that's the truth. There is no covenant between God and man uh, outside Israel. Uh, the church has no special covenant with God that is different from God's new covenant with Israel. Uh, to be saved, uh, you have to join Israel. I know that many Christians will try to argue with me because they think that this statement is wrong. But no, uh, this is the truth and the reason for making this video. And maybe why you ought to uh, look at this uh, video a couple of times. Uh, Paul's epistle to the Ephesians chapter 2 uh, verses 19 to 22. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, the saints is the holy, uh, God's holy people Israel, and members of the household of God, which is also uh, Israel, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. A dwelling place of God in the Spirit. <clears throat> now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Notice that we Gentiles are fellow citizens with the saints and belong to the household of God. The restored Israel is God's holy people, the saints. Uh, it is a church, it is the household of God, and we, the Gentiles, by faith in Jesus Christ, have received an oikonomia kais, a dispensation of grace by the blood of Christ, and have thereby been granted access into Israel. We have become fellow citizens of the saints. Uh, we have been allowed to join God's household. Do you understand? <clears throat> You are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building uh, being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you uh, also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Notice that in the book of Revelation, John describes the bride, the new Jerusalem, as uh, being built on the foundations of the apostles uh, with Jesus as a uh, cornerstone and that the entrance doors into the holy city uh, is Israel. The doors bear the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Uh, the new Jerusalem is not a physical city but a holy community built of living stones, a dwelling place of God in the spirit. It is a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. If you read uh, about the city in the Revelation of John, uh, of John uh, it is mentioned that the Spirit of God dwells in that city. Now, <clears throat> the Revelation of John chapter 21 verses 2 to 3. Then I, John, saw the holy city, uh, New Jerusalem, uh, John, he saw the bride uh, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven say, uh, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. As Paul said, it, a dwelling place of God. In the spirit, God will dwell with men, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. The holy city, the bride, the restored Israel, is God's dwelling place in the spirit. It's not a physical city, but a spiritual city where we have spiritual fellowship with God, with Jesus, the angels, and with each other, uh, which I will come back to. Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 to 14. Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high uh, 
mountain, uh, which is Mount Zion, and I'll come back to that. And he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. The bride, the wife of the Lamb, is Jerusalem. The holy people of God, the restored new covenant uh, Israel. But let's read on. Descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, having the glory of God. Uh, there are so many Christians who distance themselves from this city because it says that it came down from heaven. It is because they don't understand that the kingdom of God is a heavenly kingdom and that true faith in Christ Jesus, that kingdom of heaven, has come down into our hearts. Even though we are here on earth, uh, we are set apart with Christ in the heavenlies. Uh, we have been granted access to the heavenly Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Not the earthly Mount Zion in Arabia, but the heavenly Mount Zion. And of course, I will elaborate on that. But now, listen carefully. Her light was like a most precious stone, like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Do you remember the book of Isaiah which describes the bride Jerusalem as being built of precious stones? Isaiah chapter 54 uh, verses 11 to 12 uh, Oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comfort. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems, and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will uh, make your pinnacle of rubies, uh, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve uh, angels at the gates and uh, names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Uh, consider that the city wall is great and high, uh, which symbolizes that you can't uh, climb over the wall, you can't uh, uh, access the city except to the gates. Uh, in order uh, to access the city, you have to enter the city via the city gates. And the entrance gates uh, is Israel, uh, which is symbolized by the fact that the gates of the new restored spiritual Jerusalem bear the names of Israel's uh, twelve tribes. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now, the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve uh, apostles and of the Lamb. Again, this is what Paul was talking about uh, when he said that you were built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole build, uh, building uh, being fitted together goes into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We Gentiles who were um, once far away, excluded from the covenants of promise, excluded from Israel and the holy city of Jerusalem, we have now come near by the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Uh, through a dispensation of grace and uh, economy of guys, we have been granted permission to join God's holy people, Israel. Uh, when my wife was going to Denmark for the first time, uh, she was denied entry. Uh, the Danish foreign ministry had stopped uh, issuing uh, African uh, entry permits. Uh, the foreign ministry would not grant her a visa unless uh, she met some very special uh, requirements, uh, which she did not, and consequently there was nothing to be done. But by prayer and with God's help, I got the opportunity to talk directly with the uh, embassy uh, consular general, who, uh, contrary to uh, the rules, granted my wife a special uh, dispensation, which made it possible for her to travel to Denmark. Uh, the same with us Gentiles, we have uh, no birthright of either residency or entry into Israel, but God, the uh, consular general, uh, has, because of uh, Christ's death on the cross, issued a special dispensation of grace, a special immigration status, which makes it uh, possible to obtain permanent citizenship in Israel. Uh, we are not here on a tourist visa, asylum, or tolerated stay, or on probation, though uh, we have been adopted into God's holy people on equal terms. 
normally when you are adopted into a family, you don't automatically get inheritance uh, rights. So how did Paul know that the Gentiles uh, would not only be accepted into Israel, but also be granted the right to inherit with Israel? A good question, isn't it? Uh, Paul, he knew, uh, simply because he had read the book of uh, Ezekiel carefully. Ezekiel chapter 47 verses uh, 21 to 22. Thus you, you shall divide this land, that's the land of Israel, among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. It shall be that uh, you will divide it by lot as inheritance for yourselves, and for the strangers who dwell among you, and who bear children among you. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. Uh, they shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. That's why Paul he knew. In Ezekiel chapter 48, we can uh, read about the inheritances, but we can also read about the spiritual service in the new restored Jerusalem. The restored Israeli people are not the same as the Jewish inhabitants of the geographical Israel. Nor is the geographical Jerusalem the same as the new Jerusalem. Only Israelis who have accepted the new covenant by the blood of Christ can be considered the holy people of God, Israel. And no, I'm not wrong. Of course, God wants all Jews to become believers in Jesus, but as long as they do not believe in Jesus, they have no access to the new Jerusalem, uh, and nor do they inherit with Israel. And I will elaborate on that. When the Bible speaks of a holy people or God's holy people, uh, they are all Israelites. Uh, however, uh, those who do not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ are not included by these terms. Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 2, verses 28 to 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. You may call yourself a Jew because you have Jewish ancestry. Uh, yeah. Maybe you have been circumcised and uh, observed the law of Moses, uh, but uh, these are not God's holy people. Uh, the New Jerusalem, no, uh, only he who is circumcised in the heart by the Holy Spirit can be considered the holy people of God, a people of kings and priests who shall inherit the kingdom of God. Let me repeat the book of Jeremiah again. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which I broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall be my people. I will be their God, and they who the new covenant Israel shall be my people. The new covenant Israel shall be my people. And that is why John wrote, Revelation chapter 21, verses 2 to 3, Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and be their God. God's holy people, Israel, are those who are transformed in the heart by the Holy Spirit, also called uh, the new birth. Let me tell you the truth. The Jews who today still observe uh, the old covenant are not God's holy uh, people and do not inherit uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, 
In Paul's letter to the Galatians, Paul wrote about the New Jerusalem and about the Jews of uh, the New Covenant versus the earthly Jerusalem and the Jews of the Old Covenant. <clears throat> However, I don't have time to go into depth with uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians, but I just want to read uh, a few verses from chapter 4 uh, so you understand what I'm talking about. In chapter 4, Paul compares the Jews to two women, uh, namely the free woman Sarah and the bond woman Hagar. The free woman Sarah symbolizes the Jews born again by the Holy Spirit, while the slave woman Hagar symbolizes the Jews who still observe the law of Moses but are not born again. Paul's epistle to the Galatians chapter 4 verses 24 to 26, which things are symbolic, uh, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai. Uh, the old covenant was instituted on Mount uh, Sinai uh, in Arabia, uh, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Uh, for this Hagar is Mount uh, Sinai in Arabia and corresponds uh, to Jerusalem, uh, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Paul knew that God's people constit uh, constitute the new Jerusalem. Paul called it the mother of us all, and said that the Jews under the law, the children of the slave woman Hagar, correspond to the earthly Jerusalem, uh, while uh, the spiritually reborn Jews, uh, the, the born again Jews, uh, the children of the free woman Sarah, correspond to the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem the Jerusalem above, and now listen carefully. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 4, verses 28 to 30. Now, we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the bond uh, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. We are children by virtue of a promise, a new covenant promise. There shall come days, says the Lord, uh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, a covenant that is not like the one I made with their fathers. Uh, just as Isaac, the son of Abraham, was born by virtue of a divine promise. And those Jews who have not accepted this promise, but are still living in bondage, shall not inherit uh, with God's holy people Israel and the uh, new holy Jerusalem. No, the scripture says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the bondwoman uh, shall not, uh, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. I hope you understand. Uh, Jesus referred to the unbelieving Jews as the uh, synagogue of Satan. In Revelation chapter 3 verses 9 to 10, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, uh, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. The Jews under the old covenant, the synagogue of Satan, uh, who did not accept the gospel, are according to Jesus, not real Jews, though they lie. These uh, illegitimate Jews uh, will not be protected during the great tribulation of the end times, uh, but the Jews who accept the gospel, the real Jews, they could be preserved, do you understand? Let me repeat, uh, the illegitimate Jews, the liars, will not be protected during the great tribulation of the end times. But the Jews uh, who accepted the gospel shall rise and shine, and they will be preserved. However, the new covenant Jews, God's holy people, they will be protected. Because you have kept my command to pers uh, persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. When this preservation of uh, the real Jews happens, then the illegitimate Jews, uh, that is those uh, under the old covenant, the synagogue of Satan, they will realize that God loves his people, and many of them will come and cast themselves down at the feet of the saints. That's a prophetical promise. Now, 
consider that there is a promise that during the end times uh, many of the Jews under the old covenant will accept Jesus and get saved. Uh, but as it is now, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, the one woman's son shall simply not inherit with the free woman's son. Paul also thought that there would come a time uh, when many of the unbelieving Jews, whom Jesus called uh, Satan's uh, synagogue, would repent. Let me give you an example. Paul's uh, letter to the Romans, chapter 11, verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, uh, Paul was referring to the unbelieving Jews under the old covenant, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. So there is a prophetic promise uh, of the conversion of the unbelieving Jews, and Paul continued to elaborate uh, on this prophetic promise. Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 11, verses 25 to 27. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you uh, should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Jesus he put it another way. Uh, he said that the first will be the last, and the last will be the first. Uh, as it is, uh, God's holy people Israel and the New Jerusalem consist of those uh, who have come to believe in Jesus, uh, and the others have no part in Israel. Uh, they are false Jews uh, who will not inherit uh, with Israel. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. However, there is a prophetic promise that uh, many of them in the end times will realize the truth of the gospel and will come to faith in Jesus. They will fall prostrate down in front of the uh, the, the real Jews, the, the ones who were born again, that was the promise to the Philadelphian church, the promise uh, Isaiah uh, wrote uh, about in uh, chapter 60. The first, that is, the Jews uh, of the old covenant shall be the last, and the last, the Jews of the new covenant shall be the first. The gospel is about the restoration and salvation of Israel, and the Gentiles have been incorporated into Israel by a dispensation and have been granted inheritance uh, and uh, has been given uh, the inheritance rights together with the Jews. Uh, God's holy people is Israel, uh, and it is a bride, the new Jerusalem. In the letter to the Galatians, Paul wrote that the children of the geographical Jerusalem, they live in slavery, while the heavenly Jerusalem, the mother of all Christians, is free. At the time of Paul, the geographical Jerusalem was occupied by the Romans, and uh, there uh, were uh, probably sky-high taxes and military security checks everywhere. Uh, as a Pharisee, Paul obviously had studied the book of Isaiah chapter 54 and chapter 60 uh, through 62 uh, very thoroughly, and uh, of course he knew that the restored uh, new covenant Israel was an integrated part of the new Jerusalem. And this becomes evident from Paul's letter to the Christian Jews, in which he wrote that uh, they did not uh, become part of anything uh, torchable but have entered an untouchable, invisible spiritual community, namely the heavenly Jerusalem. The letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, uh, verses 18 to 24. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burnt with fire. Uh, Paul was referring to the roaring fire of God on Mount Horeb when uh, the Old Covenant was instituted. And to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that uh, was uh, commanded. And uh, if so much as a beast touches a mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. <clears throat> When the Old Covenant was instituted, God revealed himself as a roaring 
Tondros uh, fire on the Mount Sinai and Moses ascended up uh, on the mountain where he received the tablets of stone uh, with the God's law imprinted. This was a physical tangible event. Uh, there was something f for all the physical senses. Uh, the Israelites, they could hear, they could see, they could smell and feel God's presence and they were terrified. Uh, no one except Moses was allowed to uh, approach the mount. Uh, you can read about this yourself in the book of Exodus. Um, and Paul, he emphasized that the new covenant is not touchable like the old covenant was. No, the new covenant is a spiritual covenant. And he uh, went on to describe the untouchable kingdom. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And uh, he goes on to describe the spiritually uh, untouchable uh, Israelite community, the new Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things uh, than that of Abel. It's important to understand that we have become a part of a heavenly, spiritual, untouchable, invisible city and have entered into a spiritual communion with angels, other born-again Christians whose names are inscribed in heaven, the spirits of the righteous, a communion with God and with Jesus. The heavenly Jerusalem is not a, a very distant heavenly city in which we uh, one day will walk on streets of gold when we die or in which we one day shall be with Jesus when he comes back. No, uh, we are already in the New Jerusalem. We constitute the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem signifies our spiritual community. Do you get it? Uh, let me read it all again in context text. Uh, the letter to the Hebrews, uh, chapter 12, verses 18 to 24. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burnt with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded, uh, and if so much as a beach uh, touches a mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men, made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Isn't that great? Uh, we have entered into an Israelite spiritual community where we have spiritual fellowship uh, with one another. And not only with one another, but also with the angels, with God, the Father, and uh, Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. We don't often think about the presence of the angels, but they are there. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul says in the letter to the Hebrews, uh, I'm sorry, I assume that it was Paul who wrote that letter, that the angels are ministering spirits. Uh, they are there to take care of us, to help us, protect us, and to convey messages from God. But that is another Bible study. <clears throat> Jesus said that God's kingdom is not a visible kingdom, so you can say, here it is, or there it is. Uh, but that God's kingdom is an invisible kingdom that lives in us and among us. The New Jerusalem is a picture of that spiritual Israelite community of this invisible, intangible kingdom. In the book of Revelation, we uh, receive probably the most thorough teaching about the new restored Israel, the bride, and the new Jerusalem, but unfortunately it is also the most misunderstood teaching. Most Christians tend to separate Israel, the bride, and the new Jerusalem from each other into three different individual uh, entities. It's only a very few who understand uh, that Israel, the bride, and the new Jerusalem are an integrated uh, entity. In Revelation chapter uh, 70, uh, 
John tells us of the 144 sealed of the 12 tribes of Israel. Most people see these uh, individuals as uh, 124,000 specially selected individuals who are different from all other Christians. You are allowed to disagree with me 100% of course, uh, but I consider these 124,000 as God's holy people, Israel, the bride, the new Jerusalem. I strongly believe that the 144,000 is a, a symbolic figure. Uh, a thousand in the 144,000 symbolizes many. Uh, in my Revelation series, uh, part 20, I explain how the Bible symbolically uses the number thousand to denote many or infinite. Uh, for example, when it says that God is faithful for uh, a thousand generations, since, uh, it doesn't mean that God is forsaking his faithfulness in generation 1001. Uh, but watch part 20 of the Revelation series uh, of John for more uh, on that. The 144 is simply the square of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of Jesus. Uh, this is clearly emphasized uh, throughout the book of Revelation, beginning with the uh, 24 thrones around the throne uh, of God, representing the 12 uh, sons of Israel and the 12 apostles, as well as the design of the new Jerusalem with the dimensions of 12 times 12. The entrance doors bearing the names of the twelve sons of Israel and the twelve foundations bearing the names of the twelve uh, apostles. The city which is designed as a square, twelve by twelve, and so on. I believe that the 144,000 symbolically describe uh, God's holy people, Israel, built on the covenants of promise, namely the spiritual uh, communion of the old and later the new covenant. In uh, the Revelation of John chapter 14, we see this church of born-again people standing on Mount Zion in the spiritual world, uh, which ties in well with what Paul said, that we have not come to a touchable mountain that is burning. No, we have come to Mount Zion, to angels uh, by the thousands, and uh, to the spirits of the saints, uh, to God the judge, and to Jesus the mediator. Let me just read from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. I believe that as members of God's church, we have been sealed with God's name on our foreheads. Uh, the forehead symbolizes our attitudes and our thoughts. And now the description of the 144,000, which I believe is a bride. Revelation chapter 14, verse 4 to 5. These are the ones who were not defied with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without foe before the throne of God. In Exodus chapter 25, we can read about how many of the Israelite men they defiled themselves with the Moabite women and how the priest Pinias radically went to stop this sin. If you are a married man, you are not defiling yourself with the woman you are married to, right? Uh, but you are not a virgin either. So what did John mean when he wrote uh, the way he did? Uh, these are the ones who were not defiled with women for they are virgin. I mean, God's holy people does not consist exclusively of male virgins who have never been married or have never been with a woman. Or do they? Uh, consider that John wrote that there were found no lies in their mouths, that they are without food. Let me tell you the truth, except for Jesus Christ in human flesh, no man has ever has, has never lied. Uh, and except for Jesus Christ in human flesh, no human uh, is without uh, any faults. Am I correct? The secret of the virgins lies in the text. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. On the cross, Jesus ransomed us from the bonds of sin. Jesus, he redeemed us uh, from man's sinfulness. The precepts blood of Jesus, it, it cleanses us from all sin. In God's eyes, we are as if we have never sinned, do you understand? God's holy people are flawless, they are without sin. 
the high priest is only allowed to marry a pure virgin. But since we have all sinned and lacked the glory of God, no human being can spiritually be considered a pure virgin. But in Christ we have become pure virgins, hallelujah, we have become as if we have never sinned. Uh, after all, a, pu a pure virgin is somebody who, who uh, has never had uh, a defiling sexual relationship. And Paul, he knew this secret and that was why he said, uh, Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ as a chaste virgin to Christ. They follow the Lamb wherever it goes. If you want to maintain this purity, then you need to follow Jesus. Jesus said, My sheep follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish for eternity, and no one shall tear them out of my hand. Jesus, he has redeemed us. He has made us pure virgins, and now we follow him, and we are guaranteed eternal life. We are ransomed from men, and in God's eyes, we are without any fault, without blemish. We are like the most expensive gemstones, and uh, that uh, is why we could read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, that the city, the congregation of God, the Holy Jerusalem, was built on precious stones. We can also read about this in the book of Revelation. Come, I'll show you the bride, and the, the angel showed John the Holy Jerusalem, which looked like the most expensive gemstone. She looked like Jasper. In the New King James uh, Version, the translators uh, are well aware of uh, that the city is a bride. Uh, so instead of translating the city as an it, they translated the city as a she or as a her, which is absolutely correct. Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 to 14. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and uh, talked to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high uh, mountain, uh, Mount Zion, and showed me the great uh, city, the holy Jerusalem, uh, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Through Christ we have received the glory of God. Hallelujah. Her light was like a most precious stone, like Jasper's stone, clear as crystal. When John saw Jesus sitting on the throne, he described the appearance as Jasper. In other words, the bride, the bride looks like Jesus. We have got the glory of Jesus and now uh, to the composition of the city. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations and on them were the names of the twelve Apostles of the Lamb. Notice the uh, city's uh, measurements. The 12 by 12, which uh, gives 144, and the symbolism with the uh, thousand, the many. Revelation chapter 21, uh, uh, verse 16. The city is laid out as a square, as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. That was why John arrives at uh, 12 times 12, uh, which, as I said, uh, is equal to 144. And he measured the city with a reed, uh, 12,000 uh, furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. The measurements are symbolic and show that the city is indeed the restored Israel. It is built on the 12 tribes of Israel and on the teachings of the 12 apostles. Oh. Sorry, I got a telephone call, but uh, the measurements are uh, symbolic and show that the city is indeed the restored Israel. Uh, it is built on the 12 tribes of Israel and on the teachings of the 12 apostles, and the city is made up of uh, thousands of redeemed souls, who by the grace of God are incorporated into Israel, and therefore the city must necessarily be uh, 12,000 furlongs in all directions. Uh, you can read about the city uh, for yourself in the Revelation chapters uh, 21 and 22. And if you do, then notice all the expressions taken from uh, Isaiah uh, chapters uh, 62, uh, 62 about Israel the bride and the restored uh, Jerusalem.
God will protect his bride. Uh, just as God protected Israel uh, when they left uh, Egypt to severe plagues, so God will protect uh, his bride uh, to uh, severe plagues in the end time. Jacob is the same as Israel, and in uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, we can read a prophecy about the bride of Israel. Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 1, 2, 3. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you, I have redeemed you, I have called you uh, by your name. You are mine. Uh, you are mine. Is that not what a man says about uh, his wife? Uh, because we have been redeemed. Uh, compare this to these were redeemed from among men being first fruits uh, to God. And the lame. The wife is Israel and a good husband. Uh, he looks after his wife. So we have absolutely nothing to fear. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt uh, for your ransom, Ethiopia and Syria, in your place. When Israel left Egypt, they went to the water. They crossed the Red Sea unharmed, while all the Egyptians, uh, they drowned by the very same Red Sea. <clears throat> when Israel went up to take uh, Jericho, they crossed the uh, River Jordan unharmed. And then comes the prophecy. If you go through fire, you will not be burned. The flame will not burn you. In the end time, there's a prophecy that says that they were scorched with great fire. Uh, Israel has passed through waters and through rivers, uh, but not through fire. Consider that the water was real water and the river was real uh, was all uh, too. And I believe that the fire will be real fire. Else the prophet see, is not consistent. Uh, it doesn't make sense. In the end time, God will punish the world with fire. And the bright Israel will go to unarmed. Someone will say, uh, well, uh, Daniel's three friends, uh, didn't they go through the fire unarmed? Uh, and that, of course it's true. They went through the fire unharmed while the soldiers who carried them, they died. Uh, Daniel's three friends, they were protected because Jesus was with them to the fire. Uh, and that is a very powerful picture of what Jesus will do for his bride in the end times. Daniel's three friends, they were individuals. Uh, but Israel as a nation has never gone through the fire. Uh, they have gone through water, but never through the fire. At least not real fire. But I believe that this uh, is going to happen in the end of days. There will be a time of tribulation, but Jacob, another name for Israel, shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7. Alas, for th that day is great, uh, so that uh, none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. When the Egyptians pursued the Israelites, it was a time of trouble, uh, wasn't it? Uh, but God saved Israel through the water. The same thing happened when Daniel's three friends were thrown into the oven with fire. It was a time of trouble, a time of tribulation, but they came saved out of it. In the end times, a uh, time of uh, tribulation will rise again, during which the Antichrist will try uh, to destroy Israel. But of course, God will protect his bride. In the Revelation chapter 17, we can read about how God protects his bride, the woman with the 12 crowns. Uh, and he protects her from Antichrist's attempt to kill her. The 12 crowns symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, the woman with the 12 crowns, uh, she flees into the wilderness uh, where God provides uh, for her uh, with shelter and food. And he protects her from the dragon who seeks to engulf her. Uh, see my Revelation series uh, part 17 for more of this.
God will provide for his bride in the end of days. There are many Christians who distance themselves from Israel. They are of the opinion that the Gentile church is the bride and Israel consists uh, of the Jews of the geographical Israel. But the truth is that Israel is a bride and that the Gentiles has been incorporated into Israel by a dispensation of grace and have been granted the right of inheritance along with Israel. So we are all in the same boat. The Gentiles, the wild olive tree, have been grafted into the noble olive tree, uh, God's holy people, Israel. As mentioned, there are not two olive trees, one called the bride, God's church, and another one called Israel. No, there's only one olive tree. There's only one uh, holy people, there's only one bride, also called the New Jerusalem. Jesus is the way, and only people who follow him, people who have been ransomed from the bonds of uh, sin as a first fruits uh, for uh, God and the Lamb, can be considered the bride, God's holy people, Israel. The new covenant was given to Israel, and uh, those Israelites who do not follow Jesus, who have uh, not been ransomed by the blood of the Lamb, cannot be considered God's holy people. As Paul put it, the bondswoman's sons shall not inherit with the free woman. But there is a prophetic uh, promise that many of the Israelites who stubbornly hold on to the old covenant, uh, those whom uh, Jesus called the synagogue of Satan, that they will repent and believe in Jesus during the end times and be saved. Hallelujah. When Jesus comes, yes, then the wedding will take place uh, and then we shall always be with Jesus. And uh, I would say, uh, like Paul did it, comfort one another with these words. Thank you so much for watching this video and may God bless you.